This video is a quick recap of interval estimation involving two population parameters and hypothesis testing involving two population parameters. We've covered this topic in class, however, I just wanted to prepare this quick review uh, for the benefit of those students who want to use the videos as a way of assisting them in studying. So, the parameters we've looked at so far are basically the difference between population means and the difference between population proportions. And um, while we've done several what we call single population problems, we do have cases where we are interested in uh, the difference between two populations, male, female, Halifax, Dartmouth, um, one country, Canada, United States, and so forth. And so we could um, uh, be interested in looking at, for example, the mean monthly expenditure on gasoline for commuters in Yarmouth versus in Sydney, Nova Scotia. And we want to compare that, uh, whether or not there's a difference between the two or whether or not one is greater than the other. Um, also, we could look at a uh, difference between proportions for two populations. If we would look at uh, the Faculty of Science versus the um, School of Business, do we have a higher proportion of students um, in the School of Business graduating distinction relative to the Faculty of Science? Uh, is there a difference? Are they more or less the same, or are they, the proportions uh, different? So we're interested in answering those questions. We can answer the question either through an interval estimation or confidence interval, or by doing a hypothesis test. So I'm just sort of going to go through the, the models very quickly uh, for us, all right? So if we look at uh, estimating two population values, so we're going to start off by looking at confidence intervals first. And we will consider two cases, one where the two samples taken are independent of each other. And by that, we mean all the values in one sample have nothing to do with the values in the other. There's no connection between them. So, for example, if we took a random sample of commuters from Sydney and a random sample of commuters from Yarmouth, and we ask them to give us information on their monthly expenditure on gasoline, then in that case, um, I said commuters, I meant drivers, sorry. <laughs> um, so in a case like that, we um, would collect data from two independent groups, and the values that we get have no connection with each other. All right? Um, so that's two independent samples. However, we do have cases where we might be interested in taking um, or obtaining samples, but the samples are connected in some fashion. So, for example, if we wanted to determine whether or not a particular study technique really helps students to get better grades, we could look at a group of students and then ask them to take a particular exam um, and see how they perform. Then we could run them through this training program that teaches them how to study better, and then later on do a similar exam and see how well they do. And if this, and what we would do is compare the before and after scores for the same individuals. So in this case, we refer to those two samples, before and after, as being paired because you have uh, there's one value in the, in the sample before that is paired with a value in the sample after. Uh, we also refer to the two samples as dependent samples or we also refer to them as uh, repeated measures. That means the one person is giving you a repeated measure before, that's one, and then they repeat the measure after. So that's a particular kind of um, uh, model design used in statistics that's quite useful. Okay, and then of course we also dealing with population proportion as well. So given that, let's see what uh, we have here. We're going to start off with essentially finding a confidence interval for the difference between two population means, mu1 and mu2. And so if you recall the generic form of a confidence interval, that generic form of the confidence interval is the point, statistic, or point estimate or the sample statistic. And since we're interested in the difference between mu1 minus mu2, then the estimate of that, the point estimate of mu1 minus mu2 would be x bar 1 minus x bar 2. All right? 
And uh, so you recall that the formula was, the generic formula was point estimate plus or minus a critical value times the standard error. And so in this case here, the x bar 1 minus x bar 2 represents the point estimate, okay? And um, I'm going to just sort of go through this uh, a bit, a bit, um, not every slide one at a time, but just move to the important slides. So before we could actually decide on what model we're going to use, we need to know something about the population standard deviations or the population variances. And we need to make some assumptions. Well, the first assumption, if we're going to start off with sigma 1 and sigma 2 known, then we will have to assume that the samples are randomly chosen, right? Now, we could assume that the population distributions are normal, or that if um, both sample sizes are larger than 30, and uh, if the standard deviations are known, then that gives us one kind of model. So the first case is when sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known, in that case, we will use the standard, um, the standard normal uh, as, uh, in other words, the sampling distribution of the sample statistic x bar 1 minus x bar 2 will be a normal distribution. And so therefore, we will use the standard normal z as our critical value. The standard error is this formula right here, sigma x bar 1 minus x bar 2, but is given by this particular formula, sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. So that gives us our standard error. So now we have the point estimate. We know z is our critical value, and this is our standard error. So if we put it all together, we should get this formula right here. The confidence interval is for mu1 minus mu2 is x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus z. Now the book puts the alpha over 2 here, which basically means the z that is associated with half of alpha, the significance level. That's because in a confidence interval, we take alpha and put half in one tail and half in the other tail. And that's where the um, subscript alpha over 2 comes from. But you already know how to do that. And then, of course, here's the standard error um, of the sample statistic x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So that gives us our confidence interval, and it's very important that we know how to interpret it. When the both limits of the confidence interval are either positive or negative, we have clear evidence that one mean is greater than the other. So for example, if we, are, if we have a confidence interval for mu 1 minus mu 2, and both limits are positive, then it means that mu1 is greater than mu2, because for the difference to be positive, mu1 has to be larger than mu2. And the reverse is true. If both limits are negative, then it means mu2 is greater than mu1. That's why mu1 minus mu2 would be negative, all right? And so knowing how to interpret that confidence interval is extremely important. So I could sort of show you what I, what I mean here. Okay, um, this, uh, so it is extremely important. I'm just going to plug in my tablet so I could demonstrate this uh, for you. So what would happen is that we would have, um, we would have, um, A confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2. So we have x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus plus or minus. In our case, because we are saying that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known, sigma 1 squared over n1, sigma 2 squared over n2. So when, when you get that limit, the limits, for mu1 minus mu2, right? So we'll get a 
a lower confidence limit and an upper confidence limit. All right. So if both values are positive, so that means let's call this the positive side. This is zero, and this is the negative side. So if both limits are positive for the interval, okay, the upper and lower limits, then in this case, mu1 is greater than mu2. And on this side, mu1 is less than mu2. And then, of course, in the middle, mu1 is equal to mu2. So how we do the interpretation is that as long as the center uh, so another center, but as long as zero is contained in the interval, we do not have any clear evidence that one mean is larger than the other. Because, so I'm just going to draw an example of that. So let's say these are our limits. Well, in this case, the zero is contained in the interval. And so we have no clear evidence because at this point, the two can be the same. On this side, mu1 can be greater than mu2. On this side, mu1 can be less than mu2. So all three things are possible in that interval. And since we don't know exactly um, what the difference is, all these possibilities make it difficult for us to say for sure which one is larger than the next, all right? So that's, I just want you to know how to do that interpretation here in this case. So we're going to continue with some of the slides. So that's in the case of uh, the variances being known, we would use Z, all right? The general steps, of course, in terms of uh, developing a confidence interval, you already know that. Define the population parameter of interest. So in this case, mu1 minus mu2. Select independent samples from each population. So you take a sample from Sydney, a sample from Yarmouth. Specify the confidence interval. Is it a 95% or 90% or 98%? Then compute the point estimate, which is that when we take the sample means from both um, samples, x bar 1 minus x bar 2, then determine the standard error. And of course, if we're given sigma 1, sigma 2, we could calculate that. The critical value will depend on the confidence level that we want. So if the confidence level is 95%, we would use 1.96 and so on. And then we simply calculate the confidence interval. That's fairly straightforward, all right? Now, what happens if uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown? Well, we have two cases we usually consider. One is when they are unknown, but the sample sizes are large. And then, um, or when they are unknown and the sample sizes are small. So some assumptions that we make is that the populations are normally distributed, the variances are equal, and that the samples were randomly chosen. These are three key assumptions that we make. And uh, if for this case, we would use the T distribution, all right? So the T distribution with degrees of freedom N1 plus N2 minus 2. So we would have to make an assumption that the variances are equal. And if we make that assumption, to get an estimate of that variance, we have to pool the sample standard deviations. And so we pool the sample standard deviations as follows. That is, we basically combine the sum of squares from sample 1 with the sum of squares for sample 2, and divided by the degrees of freedom. If you recall, I'm just going to sort of demonstrate this to you. If you recall how we calculated standard deviation or variance. So let's take a look at that again. So when we're calculating standard deviation or variance, let's just think about it. Let's say S squared. S squared was essentially the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. Now, if we take the square root of that, then we would have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we would have the standard deviation. Now, if we refer to that top here as sum of squares for the x's, SSX, then we could rewrite this formula as basically the sum of squares, S, um, the variance is the sum of squares divided by n minus 1. So if I just cross multiply for a moment, I will get SSX is equal to n minus 1 
times s squared. All right. So s s x one. That's that's basically pertaining to population one. If I want to write it that way, that's basically n one minus one s one squared, and then s s x two is equal to n two minus one times s two squared. All right. So now if we go back to our, our PowerPoint presentation, I want you to pay attention to this, to this term right here. So a variance is essentially the sum of squares over n minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom. So that's the important thing to keep in mind, that a variance, a variance is a sum of squares over a degrees of freedom. All right? So if we now take a look at uh, this pool sample variance or standard deviation, you see n1 minus 1 times s1 squared, that's like SSX1. And this is SSX2. So what we're doing is we're combining all the sum of squares from the two samples, which gives us a big sum of squares. And then when we combine the degrees of freedom from the two samples, we get a big degrees of freedom. So sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom is a variance and a standard deviation is the square root of the variance okay so that is just so that you understand that how we calculate the pool standard deviation and we simply apply this formula right here to calculate the confidence interval now we pull the SP which is the pool sample standard deviation on the outside and that's because it is common to both of those if we wanted to put it back inside, it would be sp squared over n1 plus sp squared over n2. But there's really no need to keep it inside. Okay. Now, if the, if the samples are large and sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown, we can, in fact, use z. Um, we would apply the central limit theorem and then use z instead of t, in which case, if we're going to use z, then we don't need a pool sample standard deviation. We simply need to use S1 squared um, and S2 squared. So it would look something like this. Let me just uh, demonstrate that. I'm just going to clear all of this for a second. Select all and clear. So let me go back to this. So we would end up from having a formula like this, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus z s1 squared over n1 s2 squared over n2 all right so basically instead of using sigma we would end up using s uh, in, in this case right here but we would apply the central limit theorem all right good